So, in 2017, I took us through the birds of Johnson Farm. Um, I was still pretty new to birding, uh, so I was very excited to share every detail about every species that I could get my hands on at the, uh, at the farm. Having a garden here meant that I spent a lot of time uh, gardening and increasingly birding. <laughs> I think the first year that I had my wildlife lens, uh, my, my husband did a lot of gardening and I did a lot of birding. And I was very grateful that he pulled as many weeds as he did because I wasn't doing it. I was, uh, I was photographing every species I could get my hands on. Um, quick question, how many of you have never seen me do a bird presentation before? New, oh my goodness, that's so exciting. <laughs> well, welcome. Um, you know, I, I came into this uh, completely by accident and it's turned out to be a beautiful marriage of my profession, which is teaching people and presenting for a living. Uh, and uh, my passion for, for wildlife and photography. Um, so I'm excited to share all this with you. Um, I, I'm revisiting a, a, a chunk of what we did in 2017, but completely reorganized. Uh, so we're gonna kind of approach this in a slightly different way tonight. The first thing you should know is that uh, our island sits in the Puget Trough region of Audubon's designations. And in that region, there's 173 species. In 2019, when I did the wildlife presentation, uh, we were up to 132 species counted on Anderson Island. And now we're at 141. <laughs> so it's pretty exciting. Um, we are a very special ecosystem. We have a lot of birds. Um, here on the island and across so many different species. And that's because on this little piece of land, we have pretty much every ecosystem you could want to support bird populations. Um, and there's not as many humans. And so they have the latitude to, to be free, to live their lives, to share this space with us. Um, the reason we know there's 141 is because there's a whole lot of bird nerds on this island. <laughs> if you haven't found them yet, look around. There's a few here. Um, and I'll help you connect to, to others uh, toward the end of the program. Um, I didn't really realize that there were this many of us, and I should have. Uh, one reason I know it is um, I, I was inspired by... Uh, a Facebook group that I was in called Birds of Texas uh, when I was down in Austin um, and just how amazing it was to see everybody's photos and reports of what birds they were seeing. And I thought it'd be really cool to bring that, you know, home to the island. And I didn't expect it, but uh, four years later, we're up to more than 300 members um, and it's pretty active. And so if you're on Facebook and you like, uh, you know, keeping up with what birds we're seeing, it's a really fun, fun place to be. Um, but as part of that, uh, I put together uh, a birding list and a birding calendar. So back on the table uh, by the door, if you don't have that, um, or if you're not online to download it, there's printed copies back there that you can grab. Um, so it's an island-specific birding list uh, with the birds that have been seen on the island checked off and marked so that uh, you're aware that they have been seen here. There are some on that list from the Puget Trough region uh, list that are not checked off. So especially if you see one <laughs> that's not checked off on that list, we're super excited to hear a report of that. Um, and that's one of the things that comes up in the birding group a lot is uh, you know, the, the marvel of seeing a species that we haven't had reported on the island before. Um, and the calendar's really neat too. You'll kind of see tonight as I go through stuff uh, how that calendar uh, works for us. So in 2019, I was looking for a new way to present mm, bird stuff. And I asked myself if there was gonna be a travel magazine for birds to showcase places they should go, maybe it'd be called Migration and Territory Magazine and maybe they'd feature some of the island uh, destinations. So in 2019, we went through uh, Andes Marine Park as a destination for birds and why they should enjoy it. I thought maybe I'd revisit that this time as a seasonal destination edition and cover the historical Johnson Farm, uh, talking about it uh, seasonally, right? What happens here during the different seasons? Um, what birds do we see and what kind of activities do they participate in? So we're gonna start in the spring. Um, and you know, in the spring, everyone comes here to get busy, <laughs> one way or another. <laughs> 
Uh, one of the first things we see is the industrious act of nest building. Um, this American robin was in my neighbor E.B.'s garden with a mouth full of all of those uh, dead weeds that were sitting in a pile. She was very excited to, to find them, um, and she carried around mouthful after mouthful and flew them away to wherever it was that she was building a nest. Um, robins are among the first ones that we see nesting at the farm, um, at least actively in the gardens. But there's a lot of other spots uh, on the island, right? So, well, here on the Johnson Farm. So down by the wetlands trail, uh, you get a completely different sight of birds. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time in the gardens, and so we get the songbirds, and we get the birds that are enjoying the bounty there. But if you go down on that wetlands walk, um, it's a completely different ecosystem. Um, and I was so charmed to find this little, tiny, warbling vireo with nesting material. And we did some looking around and tried to figure out where she was going. And she was building this beautiful cup nest in a tree that hadn't leafed out yet. Um, just stunning. And so she demonstrates that there's a whole subsection of birds that come to our island just to nest and breed. They come here for the summer. Um, so down here along the bottom, you'll see, uh, I pulled this from our sighting calendar. Um, and so what this shows us is that the warbling vireo, we're only going to see from maybe April, definitely May through August, and then they sort of start to leave in September. So it's just one of the many birds that come here for the summer, like so many of us want to be, <laughs> um, to enjoy the, the quiet solitude of the island as a place to raise their families. And there's a lot of birds like that. Um, savannah sparrows, uh, you're not typically going to see them during the rest of the year, but you'll see them in during the summer. Another uh, thing that's happening in the spring a lot is to woo and be wooed. Um, and more specifically, there's birds that come here, again, just for uh, mating season and for, and for raising their young. Um, cedar waxwings are one of those birds. Uh, they follow the berries around the whole nation in their migration. Um, we kind of joke sometimes that we are on the cedar waxwing schedule because we go south about the same time they do. <laughs> um, so maybe we're following the berries too. Um, but they come here pretty early because the berries start... Um, start the season, but they don't breed until a little bit later in the season. So early in, uh, or mid-spring, what you're going to see is much like with the American goldfinch, you're going to see them uh, flirting and wooing and uh, behaving in all sorts of courtship rituals, which is really fun. Um, the American goldfinch doesn't have its young until much later in the summer, and that's because their babies need to be fed on seeds, basically. So they need all of our delicious food to get past the fruiting stage and get to the seed part before their young are really going to have a chance to thrive here. Um, so they're going to spend all of April and May and some of June just hanging out and having a good time before they dig into raising kids together. And so there are some birds that do something that's referred to as courtship feeding. Um, and it is the act of the male bringing the female tasty things and passing it to them beak to beak. Um, cardinals are very well known for this, but they aren't in our area. Uh, but cedar waxwings and American goldfinches do courtship feeding. And I could just watch it for hours. They're so cute. They'll sit next to each other and they'll nuzzle each other and you know, kind of flirt with whatever piece of food they might be sharing. And um, and I've early in my birding uh, knowledge, I sometimes wondered if it was babies, right? Are, are these babies that are being fed? But they had all the adult plumage. Um, they didn't look like babies. Um, and it turned out that, you know, the ladies, they like to be brought tasty treats. So, you know, show up not with flowers, show up with, like, cookies <laughs> is, is the rule. Um, and it's a really cool thing to watch. These two species in particular do it. Not all do. Um, so anytime you get a chance to see it, um, it's, it's notable that some species do it and some don't. Audience participation. It is a hummingbird. Do you know how they're making that noise? 
It's not their it's not their vocalizations. So when hummingbirds are trying to impress the ladies, uh, they fly straight up in the sky, super high, and then they fly down as fast as they can. And that sound is the sound of the wind through their tail feathers. And they practice this, and they practice this, and they practice this, and apparently there's a certain timber and a certain resonance that the ladies like. Um, and so, uh, in the late fall, too, uh, you'll, hear, you'll, you'll hear the young hummingbirds, the young male hummingbirds, starting that practicing. Um, so they basically practice from fall all the way to spring <laughs> to get it right. And then in the spring, you hear a whole lot of that. Um, and it's, it is their, uh, one of their mating ritual uh, things that they do. Um, and it's really fun, uh, both, actually, I, I think all hummingbirds do it. I don't know of any that don't. This in particular is the rufous hummingbird. And the rufous hummingbird is another one of our summer visitors. So they're not here all year. They're actually down in either Central or South America, I forget which one, uh, in the winter. And they make the long migration up here so that, again, they can flirt and have their young and raise them here on the island usually arriving you know, between March and April, and they're usually out of here end of July, beginning of August. Um, so they get here and they get to work really quickly because they uh, they're on a time schedule. <laughs> um, they don't linger, which is really interesting. So in the garden, you'll see them uh, only for the main part of the summer. As you get toward fall, you stop seeing them and you're only seeing Anna's hummingbirds. Um, they're very showy. The biggest thing that you can use to identify Rufus from other hummingbirds is, is all of this orange. Um, it is their namesake, and it is, both in the males and the females, the predominant color that you'll see. You do see green on their backs, but you're going to always see hints of that orange, which is your, uh, which is your indicator that it's a Rufus. Um, they aren't quite as uh, pugnacious as the Annas. And Annas and Rufus in the summer are the two that you're going to see here. Um, there's others in the Puget Trough region, um, but really none that we've seen on the island and none in the immediate area. So the other thing in the spring that happens is you've got the birds that are here to get their nests in place before all the crowds start to take up space. Um, so over here on the left, this is a red-winged blackbird, uh, female and young. Um, and they're going to be down in that wetlands area. So there's reeds off to the side of that big stump that sticks out of the wetlands. Um, and that's where I found them. You'll see um, the bit of reed there. Um, and if you just sit on those benches or at the edge of that wetlands for a little while and you really look and you take your uh, binoculars with you, in the spring, let's say April, May, you're definitely going to see um, the mother um, red-winged blackbirds and their young. The first babies I always see in the garden are the robins, um, and I love them. They're so awkward, and they don't look like robins yet, um, and they're just fabulous. <laughs> um, uh, I often have people say that they're surprised, right? Baby birds don't look a lot like the parent birds. Uh, and so baby bird identification is its own mystery that you get to kind of learn and solve for, uh, especially if you're gardening, because you see lots of babies. Uh, the gardens here at the farm are the perfect playground, uh, the perfect nesting area. Um, even if the parent birds don't have the babies at the gardens, they're bringing them there as soon as they can fly. <laughs> and we all know that the swallows are regular, uh, regular uh, parts of the farm property. Um, so the violet green swallows are very showy, beautiful birds, and they love all these bird nesting boxes that are scattered around uh, the farm property. Um, most of the chicken coops have them. There's uh, nesting boxes uh, in various people's gardens. Um, and these babies, man, they are all mouth. Um, I've actually got a photo where a, p a parent's head is entirely in the baby's mouth and you're a little concerned for the parent. <laughs> and then we have the barn swallows, um, which are also uh, very much a part of what you'll see on the property. So this particular mom nested, so you know where the uh, 
farm produce stand is that people leave their produce on, and you've got the information center that's right next to it that's painted red on the inside. It was up above the sign and under the eaves, and the mom was going in and out. And I don't know if you can see it, but that little baby is so young. It just has the little tuft of feathers uh, as a halo over its head. Um, so not even feathers yet. It's, it's just a little tuft of fluff. Um, so cute. And I've got a 600 millimeter lens, so I was able to stay back far enough that mom felt safe um, and just so precious. So these guys get going early. Um, it does allow them to have multiple broods in some cases, but mostly they want to get their babies out there and eating before uh, the crowds uh, come in uh, for summer breeding. Which brings us to the summer season where there's just so much bounty uh, for these birds. One of the things that you'll see at the farm a lot is just how much uh, they enjoy the water. Um, so whether it's from the hoses or the bird baths that gardeners put out, um, pine siskins and American goldfinch in particular seem to be very, very fond of any kind of water they can get themselves into. I looked through my pictures trying to find a variety of birds. I saw some towhees too, but mostly it's pine siskins and goldfinches. So, I don't know, take from that what you will. They're the water birds, um, and they are, they're maybe just the ones I was always catching, but they're uh, really enjoying all the water features that we have available. Um, especially when hoses overflow a little bit and they have a chance to be down on the ground uh, and really getting into it. Like, you can see some pretty uh, intense bathing with abandon uh, in the gardens uh, if it's a quiet day and, and people aren't bustling around. And not to belabor the point, but, you know, we all feel a little guilty when the hoses start leaking. The birds love it. <laughs> they are thanking you for your hoses that are spraying extra water for them. Um, and they are they're there. They're enjoying them. Um, so when nobody else is looking, the birds are thoroughly enjoying uh, all of that water that they have access to. <clears throat> all right, pop quiz. Who's who? Which one's the Rufus? On the right, yeah. And who's this one? That's the Annas. So, yep, those are our two hummingbirds. And again, the Rufus, you're going to see bits of orange. That's going to be your, uh, your telltale sign. All right, so powering your engines is really what these hummingbirds are all about. Um, and there's so many flowers for them to enjoy. So which hummingbird is that? It's an Anna's. And it's actually a male Anna's because the whole head is dark. Um, if you caught it with the light hitting it just right, it would all be a really bright pink. Um, the females don't have the full colored heads. They tend to have color at their throats. Who's that one? Yeah, that's a Rufus. How about that one? Rufus. That's an Anna's, and that's actually a juvenile Anna's. You'll notice that it's really only starting to get some of its colored feathers in. Um, it's probably a female, but it might be super early on, and it might be a male who's just starting to get his full uh, gordit in. Um, if you are not familiar with Lucifer's crocosmia and you love hummingbirds, it is an absolute magnet for hummingbirds. They love it. I've had other kinds of crocosmia. Crocosmia? How do you say it? Crocosmia. Um, and they don't like it nearly as much as Lucifer's. And Lucifer's gets really tall, and the flowers are much bigger. Um, I suspect that they probably have more nectar. But uh, for the gardeners, it spreads pretty badly, so you have to keep it contained. Um, but the hummingbirds lose their minds for it. So there's days where I've just sat next to Crocosmia and Bloom and just, you know, spent 45 minutes photographing hummingbirds and then gone home with 2,500 pictures that I had to sort through to find the best of them. Um, it's a sorting game. But there's all sorts of flowers, um, and they're there, and they're loving them. Um, so it's a beautiful place to, to get shots of hummingbirds. Um, I know there's, there's several photographers on the island who love to just come and walk around the gardens. 
Um, and some, I think, that started gardening because they knew all the hummingbirds were there. <laughs> Even down to the last of the season. So toward the very end of summer, when uh, all the flowers are really starting to look tattered and sad, the hummingbirds are still working them, um, which is just amazing. Uh, you, you could just get a whole different perspective when you get toward the end of summer um, and just see, uh, see this kind of sight. And then all, there's all of our birds that are just going to spend all day grazing, right? They're going to they're gonna work those seeds from sunflowers. They're going to pull leaves off uh, that might have some bugs on them. They're going to grab whatever fruiting bit it is that our tohi has. Um, but this is the summer game. They've got babies to feed. Um, they're going to be gathering as much food as they possibly can uh, and getting them to their little ones and trying to have a little snack along the way. They're also getting those protein snacks. <laughs> so I occasionally, uh, robins in particular, I don't know if you've watched robins gather food for their babies, but they do not want to make multiple trips. When they're making groceries, they are like shopping every aisle before they go back to the nest. And I've had robins with like three worms and a berry and like a seed and like, and you're like, how did you pick up each one of those things? And sometimes they'll drop them and they've got to pick them up again and they'll drop them and they'll pick them up again. Um, but robins are masters of like filling their beak before they go back to the uh, before they go back to the nest. Um, it's really pretty remarkable to see. And most of these birds that are uh, are also catching bugs, uh, western tanagers. Uh, I saw them at some point hunting bugs um, at the gardens, which was really very cool. Um, and then there's our fruit uh, robbers, which, you know, my philosophy of gardening is really 10, 15% for them is a minimum charge. Um, some years I'm probably giving them 30 or 35% of my fruit, which is fine. There's plenty for everybody. Um, cedar wax wings, they are our berry bandits. And once the raspberries start, you just can't stop them. Um, the robins and my strawberries are best friends. And early in the season, I'd say June, I'm watching mother robins um, bring their babies to my fresh strawberries that I'm waiting eagerly for and just, just going after them. And, you know, I walk into the garden and I see baby look up startled with a with red strawberry face. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> I, can't, I can't say no to you. Um, and then as we get toward the end of the season, all of those apples in the apple trees that don't get picked, the ones that are really high up, are red-breasted sapsuckers, and really all the birds are up getting those apples that nobody's reaching. Um, that's one of the amazing things about all of the fruit trees that we have um, on this property. The birds uh, really need them and love them. Uh, the one thing I don't have good pictures of, and it's on my list and I haven't achieved the goal, when that cherry tree is in bloom, you have about three days to capture all of the action of the cherries being taken off of it. And that's going to be squirrels. It's going to be raccoons. It's going to be all the birds um, taking those cherries and enjoying them. And I'm never, ever able to capture it. It's one of these years I'm just going to camp out for three days straight and see how many I can get. Um, the crows, too, and the ravens. Um, everybody loves that big cherry tree that's over by uh, the fire pit that uh, we cook the salmon on. Um, that is a very popular tree. And even outside of uh, cherry ripeness and harvesting season, everybody loves that tree. So if you're ever looking for birds, just grab binoculars and stand in front of that cherry tree. You're going to see all sorts of things. I'm convinced that some of these birds are here just to confuse me, personally. Um, probably you too, but it's, it's all about me. But what it does is it brings out my curiosity. So early in my birding life, hummingbirds eat nectar, right? It's what they need to motor, uh, to motor their engines, high octane. When I caught this picture, which is not great, but I was so surprised I didn't check all my settings. Why was this hummingbird sitting on a soaker hose licking at the ground? And I caught enough pictures, and I went and looked at the soaker hose after it was gone, and I was like, what is going on here? I do this a lot with birding. This is how I learned everything I learned. I asked that question, and then Google and I spend like three hours together looking up the answers. 
Um, in this case, what I learned was that when hummingbirds are raising young, they actually need the protein from bugs. So they're eating gnats, they're eating all of the small insects that they can get their hands on because their babies need those protein building blocks to grow big and strong. Um, so at this time of year, in the summer, you're going to see uh, hummingbirds eating uh, bugs. And a lot of times you'll actually see them licking at like the holes that the sap suckers put in trees. And that's not just because they're getting the sap, it's because bugs are all caught up in that sap. Um, so they're, they're eating the, the small insects that they can get their hands on uh, to make sure that their babies get the protein that they need. This one was a little weirder. And this isn't the only time I've seen it. So if you read up on goldfinches, the books are going to tell you they are obligate uh, uh, vegetarians. They don't eat bugs, full stop. If they eat a bug, it's an accident. They were going for a seed, they accidentally got a bug. And I was like, they were going after those aphids. I mean, there were seeds in some dill right over here. They could have had the seeds. He was working the aphids. And I have three or four other instances where I had the same thing happening, where these goldfinches were eating aphids. And after collecting three or four versions of this, I finally sat down and did my research. And the internet was full of, well, the experts say they don't eat bugs. But I have photographic evidence of these goldfinches eating, most of the time it's aphids, um, and really going to town on them. And you know, there were some theories from folks that maybe it was juveniles that were trying to figure out what you should and shouldn't eat. Um, in this case, it's a breeding plumage uh, male, right? Like, <laughs> this, is, this is not a young bird. Um, and what I've managed to gather from the reading that I've done is just, you know, it's not typically what they eat. It's not what you would normally expect them to eat. But sometimes goldfinches eat aphids. That's, that's as, as precise as I've managed to find. <laughs> um, but that was hours of research, you know? There's sort of a rabbit hole that, uh, that I get sucked into, and uh, it's super enjoyable, right? Like, when you learn what you're supposed to do, and then, uh, or, you know, what's supposed to be happening, and you're able to make observations that are counter to that, you start asking the questions. Um, and that's my favorite part of birding. Uh, it's, it's seeing behaviors um, combined with photography. Uh, with binoculars, I've gotten better now at being able to spot interesting things and then looking them up. But at first, I didn't know anything about birds. So taking pictures of them meant I could take them home and blow them up and be like, what is that? <laughs> and then I'd spend time researching it. Sometimes the birds are just here to steal the show. And that's what happens with these little ones. So chicken coop number two, these little barn swallows were sitting up on the signs and mom and dad were just working their butts off trying to feed them. Um, I was in the garden and my husband was emptying the wheelbarrow full of weeds and he came back in and he's like, hey, there's barn swallows, you gotta go see, they're so cute. And I went over with my camera and that this unfolded. And I was like, it's just so, such a perfect example of how, uh, how they're everywhere at the farm, right? I mean, just outside of chicken coop too um, and, and doing their thing. I like to think of it as false advertising. You know, he's like, well, I'm a chicken. <laughs> I need lots of food. No, no. All right, so baby ID time. Let's see how you guys do. Any idea who this baby might be? It's a sparrow. You know, there's a million of them. All right, how about if I give you one that's a little bit older? It's hard. All right, so it's a white crown sparrow. So the interesting thing about um, sparrows is as they get their adult plumage, you don't see it very well, but you, you do get some striping in their heads. As they get older, what's eventually going to be black is red, which I love. Like, as teenagers, they're redheads, which is so cute. Um, and then eventually, that red darkens up and becomes what you would expect to see in the parents. Um, you can't tell the difference between uh, the species, between, or sorry, uh, between the genders. So male and female uh, white crowned sparrows look the same. 
Um, but fun fact, uh, they actually, when they care for their young, usually they'll do two or three clutches in a summer. So the female uh, will pretty much go from laying the eggs, incubating them, they'll hatch, she'll brood them until they don't need her warmth anymore, and then she's going to move on and move on to the next batch. Uh, Dad is going to be the one running his butt back and forth, feeding these babies that are little bottomless pits. So in the middle of the summer, when you see white-crowned sparrows feeding their babies, thank Dad, because he's the one doing all that heavy lifting. <laughs> Mom is back on the nest, laying eggs, getting ready for another brood. Um, the males definitely take the second half, the older half, of the uh, raising of the chicks. All right, how about this one? It is. It's a cedar waxwing. So this is the youngest cedar waxwing I've ever seen. Um, it was sitting on the fence as we were walking, leaving the farm uh, from doing some work. And this beak is so crinkly. It's just, it's amazing how young this baby is. When they get a little bit older, they're a little bit more recognizable, and they're full of attitude. I love them. I love them. They're in the garden. They're eating the berries like crazy, and they are just full of it. Um, and they're usually with all their uh, with all their friends. And so you get I refer to them as gangs of wax wings because <laughs> it really looks like an album cover, doesn't it? And then eventually they become these stunning birds with hardly any striation in their feathering, right? They start out so striated, and that's camouflage. Um, you know, they, they need that to be able to stay hidden. Uh, but by the time they get older, they, they turn into real showstoppers. Uh, cedar waxwings are beautiful birds. All right, how about this one? This is the trickiest one. All right. How about a little bit older? This one's even weirder. <laughs> I've never seen another one that looks like this. He was very bizarrely colored. It's a spotted towhee. So here's how you know. Spotted towhees' eyes are eventually red but when they're young, they're a really bright brown. So other baby birds tend to have very dark eyes um, or blue eyes in the case of crows. But you don't really see many baby birds in the garden that have this sort of medium chocolate colored eyes. Um, and that's where, when I took this picture, I was like, what is that? And it took me a little while. I was like, well, the eyes say towhee. And then the spots on the wings also said spotted towhee. But his coloration was so bizarre. I mean, he had the right bill. Um, and that's kind of the magic of trying to ID baby birds, um, is you're just trying to find those features that mirror the grown-ups, right? Because their bills, they might change color, but they're not going to change shape. Um, some of their defining features, like the spots on their wings, are going to be there. They're just going to be really subtle. And then a lot of these birds that have very dark coloration all baby birds start out brown, and then they got to get to this coloration. Um, so you sort of start to see them more from that baby color into their adult plumage um, over the course of the summer. I don't know how many of you have seen crow babies close up, but they are so stinking cute with their little blue eyes and their curiosity. Um, this one was on the roof of the archival building right next to my garden. Uh, and I just dropped everything and stood at the back of my garden shooting, uh, you know, 20 frames per second. Um, it was amazing. And it was so curious. It was watching everything I did. It was looking around the garden, you know, trying to figure out what was what. Um, it's pretty young, uh, so it probably was pretty clueless. <laughs> it didn't have any friends with it. It was just kind of by himself um, and not calling for mom, so probably had a full stomach. Um, and this one's a house finch uh, who is still young enough that he hasn't gotten his red coloring in his head yet. Um, so he's in that transition stage as well. We tend to see both house finches and purple finches at the garden, and identifying between them can be a little bit challenging. Um, purple finches, purple's a bit of a, a misnomer, but they're very rosy, right? They're going to they're gonna have a lot more of that sort of 
bright uh, purplish red as opposed to uh, raspberry red as opposed to uh, I think of house finches as being that sort of true like fire engine red that you would expect to see. And then again, you got to head over to the wetlands because it's a totally different scene over there. And there you're going to find Mama Mallard with her 12 ducklings uh, swimming around. And the number of water birds that we see over there in the summer is just amazing. Uh, there's lots of different kinds of waterfowl that visit. And you'll hear kingfishers constantly. You don't see them a lot, but you hear them. Um, there's usually at least one resident calling and making sure everybody knows it's his territory. And then you know, they're young in that space. So here's another case of, I love taking pictures of goldfinches feeding their babies. But in every single case, it was dad. And so that made me super curious. Like, is he just getting, you know, the dad of the year award for being the one that's always on deck? And it turns out that similar to white crown sparrows, um, the males, once we get past day seven or eight after hatching, the babies don't need mom to brood them anymore. Um, so she no longer has to sit on the nest to keep them warm. And as soon as she's free, they're dads. <laughs> so <laughs> from the point at which like, they're ready to be fed uh, regularly, they've got enough feathers that they're probably going to fledge soon, their baby cycle is very short uh, because goldfinches breed so late in the season. Um, so pretty much every time you see uh, baby goldfinches out in the garden, it's going to be dad who's feeding them and getting mobbed. And they work really hard <laughs> and usually under great duress. There's, I've seen three babies on top of, of uh, dads uh, trying to get food numerous times. Um, and they're just so stinking cute. They're so excited about food with their little flapping and I love them. All right. <laughs> It is. It's a common raven. Um, did you know that we had them in the vicinity of the farm? So a number of years ago, they were actually uh, nesting just in the wetlands to the edge of the farm property. Okay, So just past where the trail is, deeper in the woods, was where they had their nest. In recent years, I think they've moved over closer to the campground um, or a little further north of the campground. Um, but it's still in the area, and the babies really like to come here and hang out. Um, how do you know you're hearing a baby raven? It's a lot like toddlers, right? They're making all the noises. They're trying to do it, but it's not quite right. Um, and you hear that a lot uh, down, down when you're down here at the property in the summer. Um, those babies are, are using their voices, and they're practicing, but it doesn't sound like adult uh, cause just yet. Another cool thing is just how many different types of vocalizations ravens make. Um, corvids, in general, are so smart and have such big vocabularies. But you don't always get the chance to hear anything beyond the alert calls or the you know calling back and forth um, and then screaming babies. When we were in Andes Marine Park, uh, we were hiking at the very beginning of the trail, and we heard a noise that sounded like water. It was the best word we could come up with. And we stopped and we listened and it kept going and I managed to record it and I took it home uh, and as we were walking closer to one of the big trees, we actually saw ravens up in the tree. How cool is that? <laughs> So sometimes when you're hearing really bizarre noises, it's likely it's, it's from the corvid family. Um, jays also like to make really strange calls to each other, um, crows as well. Uh, so when you're hearing bizarre bird calls, um, my money would be on the, the corvid family. 
But the ravens, um, because they're around every summer, um, usually I have the opportunity to see them uh, interacting. And in this case, I had a whole series of shots that I was, uh, I was actually at my house, which is just down the road, shooting toward the farm. And I was noticing these three ravens in the sky um, flying in what looked like formation, right? They were definitely just looping and making circles and flying together. And that one in the middle just looked different. Like his tail didn't have the beautiful um, wedge that you see. His, his, uh, his wings just didn't look quite right. His head looks like the wrong proportion. He just hadn't grown into his adult body yet. Same thing, third one in the row there. Um, you know, it's just all a little bit off. And as we watched, this family, mom and dad, were teaching this young one all the moves, right? They were diving, they were flying together, they were, uh, they were spinning. It was amazing. And I think we were watching sort of, you know, Flight Lessons 201. Like, now you can fly. Let's see how you can do the tricks. <laughs> um, and this went on for 20 minutes. I mean, I, I eventually just got to the point where I was like, I, I'm done with pictures because uh, I can't keep up. Um, and that's a lot of pictures to process. But it was so neat to see it um, and to see, you know, a family flight lesson um, and, and just how cool that was. They also just come hang out here. So we were going to just check the mail and we wandered through uh, the, the driveway on our way to the mailbox. And these three were just doing their thing. <laughs> um, forgive the seasickness of the motion. I was trying to creep closer and closer uh, to be able to, to see them a little bit more close up. But I mean, they're picking things up off the ground. They're kind of feeling them with their beaks. Sometimes it's a bug, sometimes it's a leaf, sometimes it's a rock. Like they don't know what anything is yet. So this is how they're exploring. Um, and they were all over the property. They did this for a while, then they went and sat on the uh, chicken coop and were yapping at each other for a while. And um, it's just really fun to watch. So, you know, late summer, they're big birds. <laughs> late summer, you basically can, can occasionally catch them just being babies, right? Exploring their universe um, at the farm where it's safe and open and there's really not anybody hanging out in the middle of the afternoon. Um, it was just remarkable to see um, and just magical enough to be able to just stop, zoom way in. <laughs> um, I was still a long ways off. You'll see they're not even looking at me like they, they could care less, um, partly because they're babies. But, um, you know, and that's one of the things about juvenile birds. Late in the summer, if you have birds that let you get anywhere close to them, it's probably because they're young and they haven't yet figured out that they shouldn't let you close to them. Um, it does make for lovely opportunities to actually see species um, up close, um, and it's pretty enjoyable. Um, but pretty much every summer, late summer, the, the ravens are somewhere around the farm. All right, so in autumn, everybody's just kind of kicking around, right? They're starting to leave if they've got to migrate, but if they don't, they're still here hanging out. It's kind of interesting um, how late the goldfinches stay, and that's, again, because they breed so late in the season, right? They want to be here in the late summer and the early fall when all the seeds are out, when everything's going to seed. So that's another thing. Um, if you want to be a friend to birds, don't deadhead things. Don't trim things back. Let stuff go for a while. The birds are going to come and clean out all your seed. Um, and so if you can resist the urge to tidy up until you really are at the end of the season and you need to pull things out, um, the birds are really going to thank you for it. So when they get here, um, the males and the females are uh, just beautiful, right? They've got that bright, bright yellow and the bright, bright black. They're in their breeding plumage. By the time they leave, they've switched to their winter plumage, their non-breeding plumage. And this gives them an opportunity to refresh their feathers, but the other thing it does is it really lets them blend in. Um, you know, that bright yellow and that bright black, it's great for being showy, but it's not great for being unobtrusive um, and, uh, and kind of blending in. So that's what they do for the winter. And while they're here toward the end of the season, you know, we've got all of our sunflowers that have gone to seed, and so you get all these kind of really like low light muted uh, pictures of the goldfinches changing color and enjoying all the seeds and harvest as we get into autumn. 
The dark-eyed juncos, um, they're going to be coming through the garden for the same thing. They're looking for all the treats everywhere that they can find. Um, and again, they're another one of those birds that I, I see all summer, but I really feel like I enjoy them most in the winter. And I think part of that is just how much they start to blend with their surroundings, right? I feel like that's their season. <laughs> Then there's the birds that bred elsewhere and come back here for the winter. Um, you know, they want that quiet, they want this space for their winter time. So golden crown sparrows are one of those birds that when you start getting into September and certainly October, if you're in the birds group, somebody's gonna be like, hey, I just saw my first golden crown sparrow, falls here. Um, sooty fox sparrows are another one that come here for the winter and they leave during the summer. So uh, there's certain indicator birds that when you see them, uh, varied thrush are another indicator bird. Uh, when you see them, you know that fall's kind of here. Summer season's done, um, our summer visitors are probably leaving, uh, and our winter guys are, are coming in. Lots of water birds do the same thing. Um, we have a lot more water birds in the winter than we do in the summer. Some of them are here to capture lunch. So Cooper's hawks and sharp-shinned hawks are not supposed to be terribly common here, um, but I feel like I see them both fairly regularly. Um, and in this case, uh, they hunt songbirds. And so the farm is an amazing place to be. <laughs> you know, you've got all the birds that are cleaning out the uh, seeds in all of the plants. Uh, and then you've got the Cooper's hawk who's looking for lunch out of Songbird. Um, one of the interesting things that you'll notice is the difference between adults and juveniles, there's a lot of differences. But one of the coolest things is that with Cooper's hawks and sharp-shinned hawks and a few others, red eyes are what you're going to see on the adults. And if you see gold eyes, those are juveniles. Um, and so... Oftentimes, in the birding group, we'll see folks who have taken pictures of Cooper's hawks or sharp-shinned hawks at their bird feeders. Um, and I don't think I've ever seen one with red eyes. It's usually the juveniles with gold eyes that are at people's feeders hoping for a free snack, <laughs> right? <laughs> trying to find the easy prey, trying to learn how to hone their craft and to hunt uh, for, their, for their meals. Um, it's just a very cool thing. Hawks in particular, uh, with their eye changes, are pretty neat. Um, pileated woodpeckers go from uh, kind of reverse. They have brown eyes when they're young, and they have gold eyes when they're adults. Um, and that's the kind of thing that, uh, it's just that curiosity thing, right? I, <laughs> again, I'm, I'm looking up facts as I'm processing pictures, and I'm like, oh, wow, eye color. That's how you can tell the difference. Um, in some species, that's a big indicator. Some of you might wonder, how do you identify a Cooper's hawk from a sharp-shinned hawk? The answer is, it's very complicated. <laughs> um, this is one that I bring up all the time when I'm trying to answer that question, because inevitably I take the picture and then I spend, you know, 45 minutes trying to answer my own question of which species did I catch. Um, I'm sure if I saw them all the time, I'd be able to do it on site, but I see them infrequently enough that I have to pull up a reminder every single time I see one. Um, if you could see them next to each other or next to other birds, it's pretty cool because you've got your sharp shinned that are about the size of a J, and you've got your uh, coopers, which are about the size of a crow. So there's a pretty big size difference, but most of the time you don't have the luxury of having something to compare their size to. Um, I'm not going to go into this. Just know there's resources if you're ever curious. Um, I am constantly Googling uh, identifying uh, coopers versus sharp shinned hawks. All right, so the robins, they're here year round, um, and they're just cool, right? Especially in the winter. I feel like they really kind of get in their zone. Um, they go from being more individualistic in breeding season where they're in their nuclear families. They start flocking again and hanging out with their friends. Um, and they're just kind of always in the winter scape that I expect. Um, and they're very chatty. I kind of love them. And they're around the property everywhere, um, especially on the outbuilding roofs. They love to be up there and then down in the fields. And then as we get toward winter, everything gets really quiet, um, except for some. Uh, defending the territory is a big one. Um, so 
Anna's hummingbirds stay here year-round. Um, they do rely an awful lot on our feeders, um, but nature also offers an interesting variety of plants that will bloom during the winter. Um, and so one of the plants here at the farm, I didn't really realize was intentionally planted because it is a winter bloomer. Um, this Anna's hummingbird is sitting in the dogwood that's right outside the gift shop. Um, and for weeks, I was seeing him sitting there looking really like, this is my territory. And I didn't really understand until I had the opportunity to see what, what he, where, where he was and what he was doing. So the bushes that are along the gift store uh, wall in December and January go full bloom. And so he was defending those blooms as his territory. And it was remarkable to see. Um, he was super mad when any other male hummingbirds came nearby. He was happy to let the ladies come and have a sip. And it's funny because I didn't really realize how well they blended until I caught this picture. I mean, he's just, he's the perfect shade of green. <laughs> it's, it's like this bush was made for him. Another really secretive bird that you just have to work pretty hard to see is the Pacific Wren. Um, they're really solitary. Um, I've found them in the reeds and tall grasses in the open fields. Uh, and they tend to like to nest down in kind of the base of, of the tall grasses. Um, I love them. I don't get to see them nearly as much as I would like to. Um, and they're so full of attitude. <laughs> I, I hike the trails, and in the spring, um, I'll hear them uh, just, just yelling at me, like the epitome of angry birds um, and what you would expect from angry birds. Uh, and they're so little, and they're so cute, and they, they're all about defending their territory as well. Um, they would rather be left in peace, which, you know, island's a good place for that, especially in the winter. All right, how about this one? It is. It's a flicker. And then I'm going to play you what is referred to I'm serious, it's referred to as the wicca wicca call. It's the call that they make to each other when they're talking as a family. It can be a courtship call, but if you're hearing it in the fall, it's really like the family talking to each other. <laughs> Almost like a guinea pig. <laughs> I love it. So I feel like every time I hear the wicka wicka ing, um, I I'm hearing a family talking to each other. Um, I feel like it's a really special thing to hear in the woods. Um, so these northern flickers, they love winter. They're flocking with their homies and with the robins because the robins are the cool kids, and everyone wants to hang out with them. Um, and they're just all over the place here. They're they're in the apple trees. They're on the buildings. They're in the fields. Um, you, you really can't miss them uh, if you're looking for them uh, at the farm property in the winter. They're also here to confuse me, I learned. So I took pictures of flickers for uh, five years, six years, never thought twice about them. And then I took this picture and I was like, wait a minute, something doesn't look right. So we have red shafted flickers here. Um, that is our subspecies that is dominant here. Um, but with this picture that was in one of the apple trees, I was like, well, that looks different, and that looks different, and that sure looks different. What's going on? We're going to talk about subspecies. All right, so red shafted flickers are in the western half of the US. Yellow shafted flickers are in the eastern, typically. You do have something called intergrade, which is when the species uh, crossbreed with one another. Um, and weird things happen when they crossbreed. You get all sorts of mixes of their uh, traits uh, and, and what they look like. 
So just for reference sake, um, eBird, super cool. You can pull up a map of the area, you can look for a specific species, and it'll show you markers of everywhere people have reported sightings. And any place that's red or red with a flame is like a super spot, right? It's been sighted a whole lot of times there. So if you're ever looking for certain kinds of birds or you ever want to find out where the hot spots are to see potentially a lot of birds, eBird, no matter where you're going in the United States, is a great place to check. It'll take you right to the birding hot spots. Um, but if you're on a curiosity project like I was, I was like, okay, so clearly red shafted flickers, they're everywhere up here. How about yellow shafted? And so it took me a while. I broke it down by year because I was just really, I had that bit in my teeth. So between 1975 and 2005, there were three different sighting spots for yellow shafted flickers. They were not in the area. They were very rare. They weren't sighted very often. Um, it just really wasn't a thing. But starting in 2006, um, until about 2010, they started showing up in a lot of other places, especially down in our neck of the woods. Um, and I actually found some newspaper articles that were archived online that talked about birders in 2006 in our area being like, how are there yellow shafted flickers here? This is so weird. There's so many of them. And like, what are they doing here? Apparently, it was the year to vacation uh, in the Pacific Northwest for yellow shafted flickers. And until 2015, this is the total number of obs observations of yellow shafted flickers that were in Washington and Oregon. Still not a lot, right? Not that many. As we get into 2011 to 2022, the area is growing, right? We're starting to see more of them. So more are coming back um, or have stuck around. But here's where it gets cool. If you look for sightings of intergrade, so ones that have been a cross of red and yellow shafted, you see they're everywhere. So that small population of yellow shafted flickers were apparently super sexy because <laughs> <laughs> they were spreading their genes around and creating a whole lot of intergrade uh, flickers that were going to share the qualities of both subspecies. So. On the left is the red shafted, on the right is the yellow shafted. Um, and you're gonna notice there's a red crescent on the head, back of the nape of the neck, uh, on the yellow shafted that isn't on the red. You're gonna notice that their crown is different. Um, you know, mostly gray with a tiny bit of tan or a lot of tan with a gray crown. Their faces have a different mustache, either red or black. And their flight feathers are obviously for their namesake. So pretty different qualities. And if we look at the birds that I then dug back through six years of photos and started asking myself, how long have I been photographing intergrade flickers and not known it? <laughs> um, all of a sudden, I had what were obviously not pure red shafted flickers um, all throughout my album, right from the beginning of shooting. I just hadn't noticed it yet. Um, so, you know, you've got the guys with the red on the back of their heads, but a red mustache. Um, or uh, red in the upper part of their wings, right? So not definitely not pure yellow shafted. Um, peaks of yellow and orange. A lot of time I was seeing um, a really, a true orange, so a, a good mix. Um, and not always constant, right? A lot of times it was gradients. A lot of times one side had it, the other side didn't. Um, and then I was seeing some black mustaches, but they weren't pure black. You can't really see it, but it starts out red up here at the top. Um, so it was just really cool for, you know, photographing and IDing this species for years and not realizing I was actually seeing an intergrade, uh, a mix between the reds and the yellows. Um, it was just a moment of, like, it's lovely to still be surprised, right? As nerdy as I am and as much time as I spend looking things up and looking at my photos, you know, this was four years ago that I was like, holy cow! <laughs> uh, and then was able to dig back through my photos and realize that they'd been there all along. I just hadn't yet noticed it. So my question to you, I mean, you're here, so why do you like birding? <laughs> yeah, they're cute. It's fun to do. 
they're, they're everywhere, right? <laughs> um, it's, it's a hobby that I think, particularly when you move to the island, at least I didn't expect it to be a hobby, and yet they're here and they're everywhere and they're so cool and they're doing stuff and you're like, wait a minute. You slow down and you start noticing. Um, for me, I would refer to it as a rabbit hole of curiosity. Um, I got my camera in 2013. I got my lens at the beginning of 2015. I started taking pictures. I wasn't a birder. I bought the lens because there's whales and I wanted the extra reach to be able to uh, capture orca and humpbacks and whales. But the birds are everywhere and I started capturing them. Um, and as I started taking the pictures, I started looking at the pictures. I wanted to know who they were and where they lived and what they did. And then I started seeing weird stuff and I looked all of that up. And one thing led to another and all of a sudden I was the girl who's gonna stand on stage in a bird dress doing a bird presentation for all of you. <laughs> I love that birding and wildlife photography and living here brings out my curiosity. I feel like out of everything I get from this island, this environment making me insatiably curious about everything I see is the magic. Um, double magic that I get to then come share it with all of you. Here's the cool thing though. We know on the island life kind of slows down, but COVID actually offered a lot of people that opportunity. Um, and the birding world kind of broke for a while because they were like, holy cow, everyone's discovered birding. Um, I think bird feeder sales like tripled. Um, the different sites that had bird tracking had numbers spike in the number of birds that were being reported, not because there's more birds, there's less, but there was more humans who were watching and reporting. This was just one example of a chickadee page on Wikipedia and what the historical visiting numbers looked like across the year compared to 2020 and 2021. Um, Bam, and that's because everybody had to slow down and there wasn't a lot to do and all of a sudden they realized that when you slow down and you look around, there's a whole world right there that you can be a part of too. Um, and the good news is, is it hasn't slowed down. It sounds like once people discovered birds, <laughs> they kept looking, they kept enjoying um, and the numbers have stayed up considerably, certainly from um, pre-COVID times. Uh, so there's more bird nerds out there. Speaking of, you know, we could always use some more. So if you're looking to get sucked in and learn more about birds, um, we do have a Facebook group called Birds of Anderson Island. Um, lots of great photos, discussions, files you can download, um, photography, settings, uh, recommended equipment, uh, birding lists, uh, sightings of who we're seeing when. Um, some good discussion. Uh, I really appreciate the community. Um, I think they really add value um, and knowledge. It's so great to be able to have a questionable ID and post it there and actually get good critical thinking about what it may or may not be and why. And then we've got the Anderson Island birding list and sighting calendar. You can download it from uh, the birding group. Uh, I mentioned it's back there on the table. You can grab one on your way out. Um, you can always email me or message me and I can get you a copy of it. Um, it's based on the Puget Trough information uh, from Audubon. So it's basically a cross section of their birding list crossed with every report that I've been able to get my hands on of bird species that have been seen on the island. Um, Another thing, if you've never seen it and encountered it, for those of you with smartphones, the Merlin app is amazing. I would never have become a bird ID person if I had to look it up in a book because I just didn't have the background to even know what category of bird I was looking at, right? To dig through books was so hard for me and unintuitive. But with Merlin, it's like magic. And I've actually done this with small kids. Um, I've opened up my laptop visiting friends and after taking pictures on their property. And their six, eight, 10 year olds have sat down with me as I've pulled up the birds I've seen in their yard. I handed them my app and made them ID what birds I was seeing in their yard. Because it's that easy. You get in the first screen, where are you? It auto detects where you are. Uh, when did you see it? It auto detects today. 
And then what size is it? Which is great. Everybody can kind of ballpark, you know, a robin versus a, a goose. And then you can pick some colors, up to three that you saw in the bird. Um, if you just pick brown, you get a lot of birds, but they all have brown in them, so your odds are pretty good. <laughs> And then what did you see them doing, which really helps them narrow down the list of birds they're going to show you, right? If it was soaring or if it was on the ground or if it was in water. And at that point, they give you a list with pictures of what the bird might be. And that to me is the magic part, right? Because I've seen it and if I can see it again, I can at least narrow it down to one or two that I think it might be, especially if I don't have a, a photo to reference, right? It was just in my memory. Um, but it's pretty cool. It's a really neat resource. Um, and I really encourage anyone who has a smartphone and is inclined to use it to, to use it. Um, recently, they added photo ID. So if you manage to snap a picture with your smartphone, you can actually then run it through without going through those steps. Um, sometimes I'll have it try the photo ID if I can't manage to identify it through the steps. Um, to see if it comes up with something else, and sometimes it does. The sound ID is magic. I've tried other sound ID apps. They were terrible. This one, assuming it can hear the birds, so it's got to be close enough, um, and all the phones are going to have a slightly different capability. But what it does is you hold it up while the screen is on, and it will show you the names of the birds that you're hearing as you're hearing them. And it builds a list, right? So let's say you're hearing five birds in the woods. Every time that it hears that bird, it's going to highlight that name. So if you have it going for a minute and you're watching it, you can actually distinguish between the flicker and the chickadees, right? And you'll, you'll see the app showing you which one is which based on sound. I want to get better at sound ID. I'm terrible at it. Um, and I feel like this is how I'm going to do it. <laughs> it's very visual, and that's what I need to be able to actually see it. Um, and so it's really cool that they've added that feature. I love it. Um, eBird, as I showed you before, is just really cool for being able to see what species are in the area and where. Um, it's also the way that you can track what you're seeing. So if you're hiking in our trails, if you're at home, you can start a bird checklist and you can check off um, how many of every species that you see or hear. Um, as you get better at identifying species, it's really fun. It's fun to be able to build birding lists of what you've seen and heard in various places. Um, I've now got lists from, you know, Washington and Utah and Texas, and it's just, it's neat. It's very cool. And the best part of it is it feeds into all the citizen science data that uh, Cornell collects. And so it really helps them track where species are and what people are seeing. Um, you're contributing to everyone's knowledge uh, when, you're, when you're tracking birds in eBird. So that's it. You got any questions? That's a good question. I've never actually looked that up. Does anybody know? Where do the goldfinches uh, overwinter? No? All right. Well, I'll add that to my list of things to look up. <laughs> Next time, I'll have that answer for you. <laughs> yes. I've got a bunch of them printed there, so grab one on the way out. Absolutely. And if you want a digital copy, if that's easier for you, just contact me. I can get you one. Um, have you seen them? They're on the list. Awesome. Well, I will check that off as seen on the island. I had them on the list, but I don't have, uh, I, I didn't have them checked off. So, yay! That's exciting. Up to 142. <laughs> yeah. They do. Yeah, no. They're, they're here year-round. Yes. Um, 
Yeah, so they have breeding colonies, um, so obviously they're multiplying at that point. Um, and they do have winter colonies. I think at some point they split off, but I would expect right now is probably when you have peak numbers. Um, because, you know, everybody's babies are still hanging out and nobody's really ventured out yet. I don't know when it thins out exactly, if they stay through the winter and then look for, uh, to spread out in the spring. It's a good question. I haven't, I haven't really looked into that. No, the bald eagles are here year round. And we have five or six nests that I know of on the island. There's probably ones I don't. Um, and right about now, so November into December, you're going to see them uh, flying with big sticks in their beaks because they're rebuilding their nests. Um, they will start uh, courtship flying, which if you haven't seen it is really cool. Basically, anytime you see two eagles in the sky uh, sort of mirroring each other, looking like they're synchronized flying, that's courtship flying. Um, so they're flirting, uh, you know, letting each other know that it's all still good. Um, and so I think here they start a little later than in the south. In the south, you'd actually see them start laying eggs in December. Um, I think here they probably lay in early February. Um, I can tell you from the nests that I've monitored, Mother's Day is the magic date that I typically see little eaglet heads pop up over the edge of a nest. And they're about four weeks old and still look like fuzzy Muppets when, when their heads pop up. Um, so, uh, yeah, so mid-May, they're at about four weeks, which means they're hatching mid-April. Um, and the incubation is pretty close to two months. It's somewhere between uh, a month and a half and two months. I haven't seen them at the farm. Um, there is a barred owl uh, that has a nest up and down Otso, depending on where in the time of year, sometimes off Edgewood. So sometimes off the back of the farm property. Near the Cammon Trail. Near the Cammon Trail, yeah. Um, so there's definitely one family that always nests in that area. There, you probably would see a barred owl, at least in those woods. I haven't seen them on the, the main part of the property, the farm part of the property. Um, but I'm not always looking. Um, I don't think we have any great horned that are immediately in this area. They're definitely on the island, but I haven't seen them in, in this center part. to deter them? <laughs> it's a quandary. It's a quandary, yeah. Um, I don't know that I've got any good answers for that. I mean, it, clearly they came to this ecosystem and found a niche that really worked for them. Um, and they've thrived, obviously. I mean, I, I feel like Stellar's Jays are synonymous with the island at this point. Um, I, I definitely wouldn't have guessed that they arrived at some point. I would have figured they were always here. Um, interestingly, on the south end of the island, we definitely see uh, scrub jays. Um, so I wonder, were you seeing scrub jays before? So they're smaller, they're sort of more brown and blue. Yeah, they definitely don't have the same kind of crest. Um, so I'd be interested if that's kind of new and to look at the trend numbers on eBird to see, you know, if, if they sort of recently came to the area and if they are a species that might challenge the Stellar's Jays a little on uh, territory. 
I doubt it. I think Jays in general, it's just their MO. Um, there's been a couple of Blue Jays seen in the Tacoma and Seattle area too, which is really bizarre. Um, that definitely was notable. Um, not on the island and not anywhere super close to here, but definitely in the general area. Yeah, Jays are, Jays are tough. Um, you know, they, they have their niche, uh, but, but a lot like, um, you know, it's hard to love a brown-headed cowbird. <laughs> it's hard to love starlings. I do, but they, they are challenging to the ecosystem in a lot of ways. So they don't. They are very solitary when they nest, and they're very territorial. So uh, a, uh, a crow family is going to be an extended family. So there's the, the mom and dad and their immediate offspring. They probably have some of last year's babies stay as helpers uh, that get some food for the, the exchange of helping guard the nest and, and bring food. Um, and they tend to allow their... Uh, previous clutches to have adjacent territory. So during breeding season, um, I've seen this down at Andes Marine Park um, five or six years with the same crow family down there. Um, they had the primary property, I, I call them uh, Oberon and Titania. <laughs> um, Oberon and Titania had the prime uh, territory where the picnic bench is on that beach. Um, they had uh, the first clutch that we were able to observe and, and be a part of them raising. Um, the next year and the year after that, uh, one of them stuck around and uh, had a mate that joined him, and they had the sort of other lagoon side, uh, the lower lagoon side uh, of the property that was theirs. And in the last two years, they've kind of pushed Titania and Oberon down the beach out of the park. Um, and Puck and, and Lucretia now have <laughs> that property, <laughs> um, the prime real estate. Um, you'll see during breeding season, they'll chase off crows with a passion, or uh, sorry, eagles with a passion. They'll chase off the ravens. They chase off everybody. They don't want anybody in their territory. And they don't want other crows because crows will raid other crows' nests. But what you get in the winter is really cool. So in the winter, they want to conserve body heat, and they get in these huge rookeries of tens of thousands of crows. Um, I've been looking for a long time to find out whether we have a rookery here on the island or if our island crows actually travel to another rookery. Um, I haven't seen evidence of thousands of crows together in the winter. If any of you do, let me know. I'm so insanely curious about whether we have that here. Um, we found uh, in University Place a huge rookery um, of wintering crows. Uh, so from now through, I assume, the rest of the winter, um, there's a little neighborhood uh, off of, <sighs> do you remember the street, David? Uh, it's right around 56th and what's the cross street? Orchard? Yeah. Orchard. Um, it's in a little neighborhood there. There's a creek that runs along the edge of a neighborhood. And we had just for years seen lots of crows flying from different directions. So we kind of zeroed in on the area. And then at one point we were off island running errands and we saw them and it was right around, you know, sunset gathering time. And we were like, all right, we're just gonna follow the crows. You know, errands and, and catching a ferry, be darned. Uh, <laughs> and we did, we followed the crows, we found the spot. And it was like, so, a. a young friend of mine uh, visited and, and saw it a few weeks later, and she referred to it, she said, it's like a crow globe. It's like a snow globe of crows. It was literally tens of thousands of crows swirling and gathering and settling. Like, they pre-roost um, in their family units, and they keep coming closer and closer to where the roost is. And then at sunset, um, this housing development had just recently been built, and the crows were all over the roofs. I'm sure the people buying there did not know what they were signing up for, that their houses were, you know, being built where there were trees that were uh, pre-roosting spots. So the, the roofs are just covered in crows, and I'm in heaven, and I'm just thinking, I'm not sure the neighbors love this, but I love this. And at just as you hit the point where, like, the sun had really gone down, all the crows lifted off of the roofs and out of the trees, the cacophony was amazing. They were all calling. 
and they started flying in a big circle and went down to the creek to wherever it is the trees were that they actually roosted overnight. Um, and we took friends there two or three different times um, and saw the same thing, bundled up, you know, <laughs> watching crows. Um, and it was amazing. So, and I knew that this was, there's a place in North Seattle that has this. There's a place just outside of Portland that has it. Um, I was just really surprised we found it in University Place. And that's close enough that I wondered if our crows fly across the water to do it or if they have a smaller rookery that they have here. And I don't have the answer to that yet. That is my, my big crow outstanding question. <laughs> Anything else? I could do this all night, but I know you guys want to go home. <laughs> all right. Well, that's it. Thanks so much for coming out. <laughs>